Simulation and Nursing Editorial Board and the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, ANAXEL's Board of Directors, are delighted to launch this, the inaugural online Journal Club Roundtable. I am Carol Durham, the immediate past president of ANAXEL, and I'm honored to be the moderator of this session. Today, we are featuring Dr. Suzanne Hetzel Campbell, the Director of the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, and others from her writing team. In 2015, they received the Naxal Best Research Paper Award for their work developing the Health Communication Ass Assessment Tool, or HCAP. Dr. Campbell is also a co-editor of Simulation Scenarios for Nurse Educators, Making It Real. She directed the development of a multi-million dollar simulation resource center in Connecticut, and she is a co-creator of this instrument, the Health Communication Assessment Tool, which is used in simulation. She continues her work on this tool, testing it both internationally and interprofessionally in collaboration with her colleagues from uh, Connecticut and the University of British Columbia. Immigrating from the U.S., Dr. Campbell is familiar with QSUN, the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses concepts, and brings curricula expertise. As a practitioner, she understands the complexities of bringing classrooms to life and bridging the gap between education and practice. Committed to the education of healthcare professionals, she recognizes nurses' role in an interprofessional setting and the need to develop knowledge, partnerships, and collaboration for the provision of excellent patient-centered healthcare. Her clinical work is in the area of lactation with underserved populations and in simulation research in the area of scholarship of teaching and learning. Presently, she is working to promote interprofessional education, research, and practice at the University of British Columbia with her partners there, as well as in the US, in Brazil, and in Hong Kong. So today, we will be discussing the article, Validating the Health Communication Assessment Tool. Dr. Campbell has prepared a few slides to highlight the key points for this important work and after which I will begin the interview. Please take a second to find the question and answer block in the Zoom program. We want you to have the opportunity to engage with Dr. Campbell and her colleagues about their work. So please enter any questions and or comments that come to mind throughout this session today. Dr. Nicole Harder and I will relay your questions to the speakers in the order that they are received. Dr. Campbell, I will turn this over to you now to introduce your team and walk us through your work as a springboard for our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Durham. And it is such a pleasure to be kicking us off in this inaugural event. I'm hoping that everyone is um, seeing and hearing okay and that you can see the slides that we have. I would like to share that my colleague, Dr. Leanne Curry, was able to be on the call with us today as well and will be helping um, to answer questions and share in the story. I really wanted to just give a nutshell, not sure how many of you are familiar with the work and the paper of what we did and what we found, but we were hoping that this inaugural roundtable would be much more about the process and empowering and encouraging those of you who are doing instrument development or research and simulation um, to just give you some shots in the arm about hints and ways to go forward. So uh, without too much further ado, I will go through the slides and Katisha's in the background helping me process through. I do want to move to slide two and acknowledge the team without whom uh, this could not have happened. Um, Dr. Michael Pagano is a PhD with a health communication background, but he's also a physician's assistant. And Eileen O'Shea is a nursing faculty with a pediatric background. They both are at Fairfield University. Christopher Bates was on the team with this um, research study that we did that got published. 
and he was a graduate student at the time in health communication at UBC, myself, Dr. Leanne Curry, who's an associate professor in the School of Nursing, and Elizabeth Chamberlain, who brought a statistical background and expertise for the team from there. Um, and that just gives you the DOI and other information about where to find the article. So slide three. Um, as Carol said, I do want to disclose that I am co-editor of Simulation Scenarios for Nursing Educators. I'm happy to say that next Friday we will be submitting the third edition in press and ready to go with over 100 authors, an international component, including Canadian, Hong Kong, and Brazil authors as well. And I do sit on the editorial board of Clinical Simulation and Nursing. My other co-authors have nothing to disclose. Next slide, please. So just as a background on, and why we got interested in this area of communication, um, when we did the first edition of the simulation scenario text, my co-editor Karen Daly and I realized that there were three key areas in simulation that were being met um, for our nursing students, that they needed to think critically, communicate effectively, and intervene therapeutically. And so over the past eight to 10 years, I really have taken this communication piece. We all know the research that demonstrates that many of the adverse events that occur are related to a lack of communication or safe handover, and oftentimes that that can be a solution. So it definitely is an area that we need to be teaching pre-licensure health professional students about. And clinical simulations provide an opportunity not only to assess how students are interacting in communication, but also provide them feedback so that they can try again and do a better job. So the purpose of the study was to further validate this health communication assessment tool we had developed. Next slide, please. Our goal was to create an instrument so faculty could assess student skills, but that it also would be able to provide feedback for faculty and students to improve their provider-patient relationships. We wanted it to be useful for not just nursing students, but healthcare professional students in general. And we wanted them to be able to assess their own communication with its use if possible. And finally, looking for something that would allow us to get at that health and interprofessional communication aspect. Next slide, please. This is just as a little background to remind us of what effective interpersonal communication looks like. It definitely involves sharing of power and a mutual um, ability to share information. We like to see trust and an interdependence between the practitioner and patients. And it only succeeds if we are able to share symbols and provide each other feedback that we are making correct assumptions. Next slide. So what was our goal? We really recognizing how communication is focused on interprofessional communication, I do want to um, emphasize that this tool is looking specifically at healthcare providers and patients. It's not about patient handover. It's not about communication between providers. It really is specific to provider and patient. We assume there are two speak to speakers involved who have mutual goals and we know that it relies on them sharing not only verbal messages but nonverbal messages as well again we want to see that it enhances trust so our goal was to create a tool looking at both verbal and nonverbal that would be beneficial to faculty and students that would expand simulation beyond just clinical skill evaluation, some people refer to it as non-technical skills, and that wouldn't require a unique simulation scenario, but that was actually a tool that could be done alongside any other evaluation of a simulation event to get a sense for the communication that was happening there. Next slide, please. The way um, that we decided to test this instrument was to reach out to educators, and this covered all health professional areas, it wasn't just nursing, and the requirement was that they be teaching 
in the health professions and have used simulation to teach. We ended up with 218 educators from around the globe and um, we recruited them using emails that went out through an axle through the sim summit which is the royal college of physicians and surgeons in canada and through some other areas um, within canada and the u.s um, that could help us with recruiting people it did end up being snowball sampling where people actually shared the link and we ended up with about 240 participants but 218 is what we were able to use and i've listed there the groups where where we um found individuals from next slide please the simulation video that we sent out to the people who participated was a simple five minute high risk newborn simulation. It was a nine pound baby of an infant of a diabetic mother who experienced a hypoglycemic event. There were three female students in the scenario. One was acting as the student nurse, one was an assistant, and the third student enacted the role of a postpartum mother. The, we used the Laridol Sim baby in an open incubator, and the monitor was visible with the vital signs of the infant for the students. They performed normal clinical skills and communicated with the mother as they went. We then had the um, participants in the research study look at the 22 item scale and rate the student nurse. We asked them to focus on just one student as to their communication in this scenario. And that whole process took uh, participants between 15 and 20 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is what I just shared with you. They watched the video. They completed the 22-item scale. It was a five-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And the midpoint of the scale was a three for unsure. Higher scores meant more effective communication behaviors. And the next slide shows you um, the tool itself, which was published in the article. I realize that you can't read it all there, but I thought it would be helpful just to see what the setup looked like. Now, this was an online survey, so they did um, use it in this method. Next, please. The prior studies that led up to this study were using 19 diverse clinical sims. We identified common communication behaviors and topics and used a rather grounded theory approach to develop the first set of um, the health communication assessment tool that was tested with students and faculty evaluating on these 19 clinical scenarios and we did the initial statistical analysis tweaked some of the items and it was kind of that expert content review level and then we went to this second study which you saw pu published where we actually tested the tool internationally and interprofessionally Next slide, please. And I can answer questions about that if people want more details. I thought it might be helpful just to see a quick snapshot of the people who actually did participate. And the interesting thing on an international level is that people have different titles for what people are called. Um, and that's why you'll see 40 uh, were in an other category, not of professor, lecturer, or senior instructor. You will also notice that we did have a widespread, but not surprisingly, the majority of um, participants were RNs, and the variety in countries of origin. And um, you can see here that there was only one from Chile and Qatar, and we weren't 100% sure about the English speaking capabilities. So we did have, we did do some extra statistical analysis to look at that. The large majority, 151, have been teaching greater than five years. And I think that speaks well to the population that did this testing with us. So on to the results. Next slide, please. Um, the exploratory factor analysis revealed a five-factor model, which was very similar to what we had gotten in our initial testing, and the average intraclass correlation of the factors was high. Um, what 
that meant for us was that basically if if we looked at the whole tool of 22 items when three raider we would need three raiders to get kind of acceptable agreement on it However, if we went and looked at items individually, those intra-class correlations were not as strong. They were more moderate. And so it would be necessary to have seven raters scoring to get acceptable levels of agreement. We can talk more about what that could mean for it. So what was the five-factor analysis? Next slide, please. We identified five areas, empathic behaviors, introduction behaviors, trust building, patient and family education, and power sharing. And we ended up retaining all of the factors despite the fact that there were some low Cronbax alphas in that, they still contributed to the model. When we looked at those items individually, item four used positive communication, including smile to encourage interaction. That cross-loaded on both factor two, which was introduction behaviors, and factor four, patient family education behaviors. So there was some cross-loading of individual items on the five factors, and we looked at that statistically as well. The next slide, please, talks about limitations. Um, I think that the utilization of a cross-cultural lens is important when we're assessing health communication behaviors. And the fact that we used this um, with international participants taking a look at at it, they were still looking at a very US centric um, simulation video. And we know that, especially with something like communication, there are cultural differences. Um, we wonder too whether the individuals participating who viewed the simulation in real time might have scored it differently than having to view it and then go to the web survey and do it if they could have looked at it more than once. They already mentioned the language barrier with the study being done entirely in English and participants speaking English. And um, there were a couple of countries that only had one person. So first, the statistical analysis, we did end up pulling together those countries as other. So the conclusions on the next slide were that um, we could use the health communication assessment tool to um, assess communication of a video with a web-based methodology. So just the method of being able to assess was important and that it was relevant for an international and interprofessional sample. Um, we did restrict the results and that's why we had about 240 but kept 218 to people who were healthcare faculty teaching using clinical simulation and the analysis of it with this sample did give further evidence that it was a reliable and valid tool there did not appear to be any difference in reliability of assessment according to country, profession, or years of experience teaching. We pulled all those factors out and there were no significant differences for them. So as far as implications for future research, the almost final slide. Um, sorry, yes, one more, Katisha, thank you. Uh, when we went to use this tool in an international venue, I had a graduate student from Brazil um, who may be on the, the line with us today, Natalia, who we tried to translate this into Portuguese. And we found that it did have a US centric and kind of a medical model component to it that was not translating easily or well. So in the meantime, we have developed a new global interprofessional therapeutic communication scale um, using all the lessons learned from this and a train the trainer mode of educating faculty with professionally developed videos. So that's kind of the future research that this has informed. We're in the midst of testing that right now and using it in a provincial study and have colleagues in Brazil, Quebec, and Chile right now, as well as Hong Kong and India that we're hoping to translate the GITCS into moving forward. 
Um, the last slide, I believe, is just the record of the publications related to the development. And as you can see, there were two other levels, uh, developing the tool and a descriptive analysis of the nursing student communication behaviors before we got to this level where we actually were testing it internationally and interprofessionally. So I might just ask at this point, Carol, if Leanne has anything to add or if we should open up to questions from you, I know, to start the dialogue and then from others. So Leanne, do you have anything that you would like to add at this point? Um, I just want to point out, thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, I think it provided a nice snapshot. And I, you um, went over the statistics um, a little, um, cursorily, and I want to just say that um, if anybody has questions about the stats, um, which were actually a little more complicated than some other factor analysis or instrument development uh, manuscripts you might read, I'm happy to answer anything. So don't be afraid to ask specific questions about the, the stats that we used. Perfect. Leanne, this and team, this is really uh, amazing work. And I think one of the things that's exciting about this is that we really don't know how well we're training around communication. And this tool gives us an opportunity to examine that in a simulated setting, help students refine that as they move into clinical, and how important it is to patient outcomes that we actually have the opportunity to um, do effective communication with them around all the issues of healthcare and to build that trust. Um, I'm really, uh, I'd like to open the questions. Currently, there aren't any other questions. So I'd like to open one with like, what really was, um, where did you begin thinking about putting this together as an article? Um, I know that sometimes many people, let me step back one, one step. Many people think I want to uh, develop an instrument. And instrument development is really complex, and it's not one and done. And um, I'd like to know a little bit more about where the idea for this article began. And Carol, you know, it's such a good point because I can go back 20 some odd years. I had an instrument development course as part of my PhD and developed a breastfeeding self-efficacy tool. and in the process of doing that, I, I have always been interested in instrument development. I think what is unusual, and you can see that um, the first publication there on the development of the tool itself um, was a very different approach from how I had done instrument development in the past. And that was watching the videos and identifying the behaviors. And rather than doing we still did the review of lit and that kind of thing, but it was more of that grounded theory approach to develop the actual items. And I think um, that that was a lesson learned for me uh, with this research was that if we truly were going to say it was could be used for any health professional and involve and could be used um, internationally, that we needed to be thinking a little bit more broadly. Um, so Leanne and I were laughing a little bit because the idea for this actual research study came um, in a bar and is written, the initial idea is written on a napkin. <laughs> I, we, you know, we had met, I was new to BC and I was describing for her the up to then, you know, five or six years of research in this health communication area and with her informatics background, you know, sort of saying, I, you know, we need to test this tool more and wider and how might we do it? And so the whole idea came, um, came together in a bar and we wrote it down and then we had several conference calls with the team back in Connecticut and they thought it was really exciting. And the graduate students um, participation too was to help us to recruit people. Because I think another reason why it was successful was the breadth and depth of people we were able to recruit to participate in the study. I'm impressed with that and the numbers of and the types of people that you've involved and I cannot imagine the kind of work that it took to bring those people together, but it certainly makes it a much richer um, research to do that. 
one of my mentors was Elizabeth Turnquist, and she was a journalist who worked with our school of nursing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And she talked about always carrying with you at that time, paper and pencil, a notebook that you would actually write down these ideas. Um, I think sometimes we don't need to underestimate that networking that occurs in those informal environments and mm -hmm. how seeds of generations of amazing ideas occur there. Um, mm -hmm. as you have just described, and then looking at who else do we need to have around the table to really make this work and be more um, robust than it might be if we just went with those of us who are thinking about it at this moment. Um, I know that the factor analysis and the research complexity that occurred behind this tool um, really is something that oftentimes as nurses we don't um, embrace, but it, I noticed that you did hire a statistician and someone who sometimes I think in nursing, we believe that we need to be all things to all people, but what we really need to do is know who we need to have their expertise at the table, just as you've described with the interprofessional approaches that you're using here, but also in our work, who else do we need to enhance our teams with? And you seem to have done that in a very wise in forward-thinking manner. So, and Carol, yeah, the other piece I can that comment I on that. Actually, the okay. um, the the person who was the statistician on this project was um, a PhD prepared uh, person who was on my research team. This is Leanne speaking, uh -huh. and we um, um, got engaged. I engaged her in the project. Uh, we were doing some other um, instrument development for my main research study at that time. And the um, some of the things that were particularly interesting to her as a statistician was uh, was this idea of getting this interclass correlation down right and realizing that it wasn't well described in a lot of the literature. So f from her perspective, she really enjoyed the the tangly uh, challenges related to the stats. So rather than sometimes we see, oh, a statistician will provide a service for us. Mm -hmm. Instead, she saw it as a um, statistical challenge and really went um, deep into the literature to identify what was the best method. And we had multiple iterations and many, many data meetings where she came up to speed on really understanding the nuances of what the meaning of that actual question was that was in the, um, uh, so her, her data that you know the analysis of the data had um, certain conclusions, but there are qualitative decisions that need to be made along the way. And as Suzanne mentioned in the presentation, the the decision to include some of the factors that were um, had a um, a lower Cronbach's alpha um, was a shared decision based on the statistical expertise as well as the expertise of the simulation experts and the communication experts. So that really shows a lot of teamwork and collaboration, really deploying the expertise around the table to make those informed decisions. And I think that that is something that this article is highlighting or this discussion is, is that it's not, um, always by the book, but we have to look at it in the context of what we're trying to accomplish and what is the question that we have posed. And looking at all the variables that have come into play here, how do we best do that? Um, I was also struck, Suzanne, with your comment that instead of just deciding what I needed to ask, I used a grounded theory by looking at the videos and saying, what are, are the behaviors that we're seeing? Mm -hmm. And how do we explore it more deeply about not only what we're receiving, seeing that we like, but what are we also seeing that we would like to enhance? And that helped to guide your work. I think that's a different way of thinking about instrument development because often we think about, I need to create a list of questions. Right. But you really looked at it differently. Do you want to talk a little bit more, either you or Leanne, about that work as well? 
Well, and I think um, it's important to reflect just a little bit and for our audience to reassure you, uh, this has been an eight year in process project from when we very first started. Um, Michael was health communication faculty in the in the School of Arts and Sciences, and he was coming into our second year baccalaureate nursing students courses teaching health communication. I think he did two or three lectures. My colleague Eileen and I got to teach them in their third year and fourth year obstetrics and pediatrics, and we felt like they'd lost everything. They didn't yeah. need to remember it or they weren't enacting it or whatever. So, so this came over time too with the, so how do we measure it? How do we measure communication and decide? The other piece that I didn't mention that was instrumental in our um, getting the communication tool to where it is today are those impromptu discussions and peer review supports from the editorial group at Clinical Simulation and Nursing. Um, we had Susie on the phone way back when in 2008 just talking about this project and she was really excited about it and helped us think about how it could best be articulated in an article. And then when it came to the second article that Eileen um, led, the, uh, and I just lost my train of thought, um, how we were presenting the statistics and we didn't have, uh, we had a statistician, but not at the level that Elizabeth brought and the referees that the ClinSim and Nursing Journal group got together to help us with that aspect made really good suggestions. As Leanne mentioned, there were numerous iterations of this and it really is with the support of the groups that are out there to help you with this. For, so for all those aspiring instrument development people and people that want to get the research published, there is support and help out there. And it really does help to talk it through with people. I think not being afraid to ask those questions and to actually be able to just be vulnerable enough to say, here's where I'm stuck. And can you help me somehow to see a different point of view? is really important, um, it's particularly if you're, and that's one of the things that I, I think Anaxel does. Anaxel really brings together a community of practitioners who are using simulation and have a lot of brain power that can look at things from different points of view. So the way you describe that is a beautiful illustration of our amazing editorial board and editor editors, but also the willingness to share that is evident throughout all the members of an axle in the leadership within an axle. Um, I also am intrigued by one of the factors that you found was empathy. And empathy is one of the things that we struggle with because we want our learners to be empathetic. Um, and I was curious about what are some of the insights that you might have gained from your work about empathy in ways that we in education who maybe are not actually working on tool development, but rather actually educating, what has influenced your education after doing this work? That's a really tricky question, Carol, because I think, um, and so I'm going to sidewind for half a minute. I sure. had been doing an article um, looking at, so, I did some discourse analysis of individual scenarios themselves. And when students played the role of a family member, they demonstrated more empathetic behaviors. And at that time, I was trying to figure out how to measure empathy. And you know, there are millions of tools, but it is a, a non-tangible that is very difficult to get at. And I think we're refocusing it with our approach at patient-centered, and um, I'm reminded now of a tool, Gawande's Being Mortal book, where he yeah. talks about the health professional as information sharing or as collaborator, partner, um, helping people go through the experience. And that really, to me, is more what empathy is. So, I, you know, I'm trying to think offhand um, and compare. I would need to look at how we're managing it 
a little differently because it turned up in the global scale, but in a different way than we had been measuring it in the health communication. Well, I think that that actually is an il illustrative point that um, what you begin work at in one direction brings to you data that is rich and can be lifelong work as, right. you, as you work through that data and what it's revealed to you. So I think that that's a really encouraging thing that um, gets started. And while it may take you a long time, it becomes your career's work. And exactly. that's kind of exciting. It um, is. And I guess I, I would like to stress too that what has been very helpful for me is to be framing this around a theory. So the framework for learning and simulation that Karen and I outlined in the first edition of our book, we haven't been testing as well as we want to, but it fits beautifully with the Jeffries model and what even an Axel glossary has put forward, the critical thinking, intervening therapeutically and communicating effectively as just three core components of health professional education and core areas where simulation helps the student move from all that foundational knowledge to actual application and then translation into their behaviors, which hopefully ultimately leads to safer patient outcomes and more sharing. But which is what we're really all about, that patient and the better outcomes that occur there from that quality and safety work. I think one of the things that you uh, touched on there is that oftentimes when um, people go on for advanced education, it, sometimes the work that they have to do around frameworks and theories seems to be in the abstract. Right. But in actuality, you have um, highlighted the way that it becomes um, a concrete application to the work that you do. And that's why it's important for us to do that. Exactly. And uh, it's interesting because the conversation I was having earlier, we were talking about self-efficacy. And I love Susie's article about, you know, have we missed the boat with self-efficacy or what are we really measuring? But it is really important for students to feel confident about what they're doing as new nurses. And self-efficacy, there are four major forms and ways that students gain that. The most likely being the inactive attainment actually being able to do the action or behavior. But the second is vicarious experience. And I found with nursing students, I would have a class observing for that were in the scenario and all of the students would say they got something from that experience. So that vicarious experience, the verbal persuasion is where facilitators and coaches within the simulation environment can be supporting students and building up their confidence. And then the performance fear can be managed in a simulated environment because students know they can't do permanent damage and then translate it into a clinical environment. So there are many aspects of simulation education that fit the Vandura self-efficacy model and social cognitive theory. Excellent point. I just want to remind the attendees on this um, session that if you have questions, any questions good, about um, any components of this article or a chance to pick the brains of these amazing researchers, please enter your question in the question and answer block. And uh, Nicole Harder, our uh, current editor of ClinSim, and myself will be monitoring that and bringing those forward to our speakers. Um, other things that um, come to mind as you think about this journey that you've been on and the way that you have looked at refining this work as you move forward in the things that you've done, Suzanne? Um, I mean, there is a lot of pride involved um, on behalf of the whole team and how far we've come in time. 
And I think the lessons learned, as you said, maybe I need to start carrying that notebook around with me again and writing down ideas because every aspect you do sparks a new idea. Uh, Leah, and I'd be curious to have you pipe in a little bit too because you jumped in after our team in Connecticut was pretty well formed and really helped shepherd us through this next project. Um, yeah, I think that um, it, I'm um, uh, an informatics researcher and my goal is to, one of my goals is to make sure that um, nurses work is visible. And so one of the things that really resonated with me with this um, communication tool development is um, just what you said, Carol, is some of the stuff is abstract and might appear uh, invisible. And I think, um, and this is just my, um, my little special world word I like to use, I like to say um, tools like this can help us disinvisibilize <laughs> nurses' work because it takes the um, abstract idea of what is empathy or um, some of these empathy questions are really around self-awareness um, is and, and that's what we really try to teach. We know an excellent clinician when we see Absolutely. them behaving in a very self-aware manner and actually listening to somebody and not just talking about something. So it, the um, participating in this group, it was really exciting for me from a um, disinvisibilizing nursing perspective um, and because my work is um, mixed method so I, I do um, quant and qual work it um, I think it was a nice fit and um, it was actually um, really exciting to get into looking at some of those um, advancing the ideas and thinking about how do we actually measure interclass correlations when, when we've got multiple raters um, from very disparate settings and advancing that science was uh, quite exciting for me as well. I really love your new word and also <laughs> the idea that it is very, um, we do know an expert clinician when we see them, don't we? But mm -hmm. how do you take that expert that maybe has had 10,000 hours or 10 years of work and bring that back to the novice learner and start laying the platform from which they will become that expert clinician at a later date. So that's what makes this work really meaningful and exciting. We have a couple of questions I'd like to pose. One may be similar to one we've just discussed, but let me throw it out there. Shannon asks, uh, she says, I'm curious how this tool has been used in nursing education. Have any changes been made to how students are taught therapeutic communication? Shannon, that is such a fabulous question because I mentioned a little bit about how at Fairfield we actually had integrated it into the curriculum and had somebody coming and teaching the students. What ended up happening as we used HCAT is that we began integrating it more throughout the program and we could evaluate it and give students feedback. So the tool was developed in a way that a student could see areas they could improve upon. They were actual either knowledge or skills or behaviors that they could change. Um, from the UBC side, we actually have another study going where we have created an online communication curriculum. Now this is specific to patient handovers. So it is within a larger interprofessional group in British Columbia and we are looking at urgent and non-urgent handovers. So SBAR and iDraw is a BC tool that we're trying to get out there published but also the IPASS um, process for the residents. But we've created an online curriculum and then used two specific simulations to help the student to help the students unpack. So the online modules provide them information, have interactive um, videos they can watch and have multiple choice questions to evaluate their knowledge as they go along. They have to have completed that. Then they come into the sim lab and they run through a scenario. So 
My hope is that we will find other ways to develop it. But I want to go back to one of our major goals, which was that this tool was meant to be a standalone and was meant to be able to be used regardless of what else was going on in a scenario or at a clinical site. So theoretically, it could be used to um, to assess a student in a simulation where you had other clinical factors you're evaluating, or even just as a clinical faculty member to say, on this day at this time, let me do a quick evaluation, give the students some feedback, and evaluate them later in the term. That could be one way to use it. Um, with the global interprofessional tool that we're testing at nine schools of nursing in DC, we actually will have students at all different levels with nine different curriculums. So when you think about therapeutic communication, we're hoping that it will inform, do we have it embedded well enough? What is the best format to embed it in nursing education? Is it something that can be set up as a module that with a you know, simulated environment to, to evaluate it and assess it for the students and provide them feedback, that that's a simple way to do it, but then how do we revisit it across the curriculum to make sure they're maintaining the behaviors. Sorry if that was too long-winded a response. Great that, question. That actually ties in nicely to our next question, but I just want to interject that the SBAR, obviously, we know a lot about, but IPASS comes out of the team steps right. curriculum. If right. listeners are trying to figure out where they might get access to that as another tool that's out there for communication. Right. So Thank Paula you. asked, um, I am interested in investigating more regarding how we can develop empathy and compassion in the simulated setting, which I think dovetails with your last comment about ways that you're trying to explore that. Is there anything else you would like to add to Paula's question? Yeah, you know, Paula, it, when I first um, started exploring simulation and innovative models, we had a faculty learning community at Fairfield where we um, met every other week for a year and a half. And we thought that we'd be looking at, you know, new teaching methods and trying new things out in our classrooms. And we spent the first six months looking at the brain. How do students learn? Empathy is in the frontal lobe. And I think when I started looking at the literature, we've had a 10% decrease in levels of empathy in our entering college students in the US, I'm pretty sure the study was, and like a 15% increase in narcissism. So wow. I think there is a generational component. I think there is um, an upbringing and cultural component that we as nurse educators will not have have a lot of control of, but I do believe that a simulated setting allows us to role model because part of what I'm reading into your, your question is something that came up in this third edition of our text, um, and that is simulation bullying or kind of inappropriate uh, behaviors in a sim lab. And so is it empathy and compassion on the part of nursing faculty and facilitators or in the students to become better healthcare practitioners? I think there are two sides to it and how we use it. And I think it's a rich area for research. So uh, I th we'll look forward to reading about that because I think that that's an interesting thing. And um, Generations do change across time. So, exactly. and we as educators have to be responsive to those changes. So that was interesting. Your study of the brain really matters because if you don't know how learners learn, then you'll be teaching in a way that is not meaningful. Um, go ahead, Suzanne. Didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I mean, I, and I just, I had another thought. Um, that students do have different learning styles. My student in Brazil just defended her dissertation and she has um, an online teaching module for students around uh, preterm infant skin care. And she did look at whether the learning styles made a difference 
for how well the students learned with this type of learning, and it really didn't. So I think that's another area where simulation can be rich. And I, I always like to say to people, um, it isn't just simulation. As nursing faculty, you bring such a depth and breadth with your own clinical expertise and background and that expert nurse component. And as nurse educators, you bring so much of how we help students unpack theory and foundational knowledge in a clinical setting working with live patients. That's why I mentioned the role modeling, because I think as faculty, we need to be empathetic and compassionate, even in the simulated environment, and help st p students to understand, even if it's a high stakes um, graded evaluation, that there is opportunity for growth and learning, because we learn best by our mistakes. Well, and I also think that we're being watched. And the learner is trying to figure out who to watch to role model after. And that's true in your interactions with interprofessionals as well. So I think that that is really um, important. We have another question that's popped up that says, could the speaker provide the reference for her comments on empathy research? She's very interested in this topic as applied in healthcare delivery. It's Edward, I'm sorry. And um, so- and Edward, fortunately, Anna has just posted in the chat for everyone, the October 2015 SSH journal, Behrman and colleagues, a systematic review literature review of learning empathy through simulation. And as I mentioned, I had picked this up a year two ago to move forward, and that's the quoted statistics about 10% decrease in empathy and 15% increase in narcissism. Those were probably 2010 studies. So this is much more up to date and would definitely be worth us going to take a look at. I know I'm going to cut and paste the reference right now. Thank you. And if you could post it um, in, that would be great. And also there's a person who's interested in your instrument in Turkey, so I can send you that offline. I wanted to ask a couple more questions because this has just been an amazing conversation with you and your colleagues. What makes you most proud about this manuscript, this award-winning manuscript that you have? Well, and Carol, that's where I have to say, we were all so humbled and excited and it felt like all the years of work had uh, paid off. But I think, um, you know, the pride comes in the team effort and the humbling recognition that it wasn't alone. It was all the people who participated, all the students who have taught us along the way. And the hope is that it will, it, two hopes. One is that it'll make nursing education as fun as it's supposed to be with positive outcomes. But the other hope is that faculty who is doing such wonderful work out there will um, be empowered by the knowledge that they can write this up and share it too. And even if it's in a beginning format, they can build on it. And there are others out there who are very interested in what they're doing. I really like that you recognize the students were an important piece of this as well, because we have, um, we, if we're truly true to, I don't know if it was you or Leanne talking about this co-production that we are engaged in, this co-production of education, mm -hmm. um, where it's co-production of health even with our patients. Um, I think we need to take that co-production instead of us being the person delivering the information to co-produce it with our patients. We need to take that to our students as well and co-produce the education, learn from and with each other about what's happening. And I think that, that your, your acknowledgement, your gratitude to that is also important to bring in the joy of education to our work. And I think that that's really a well-stated comment that you made. Thank you. Um, so what's next for you as you're thinking about uh, your next steps in this journey? Um, I mentioned I made just a small reference to, and I'm worried, can you still hear me, Carol? Yes, we can. Because for some reason I've lost sight of everyone. We can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Um, we have developed this global instrument, uh, global interprofessional therapeutic communication scale, GIT. 
PCS. We are at the end stages of reliability and validity testing. We have professional videos which will allow us to do some train the trainer for that and we're really excited about being able to share that um, with our networking community. I think um, that there will be opportunities for people to use that. We're hoping to publish it as well. And I'm excited about having the opportunity to be getting back to my teaching and research to be doing this. I had some exciting conversations with Drexel University. We're looking at some partnerships there. I'm really involved with the Anaxel Nurse Practitioner Group. And we're looking at how simulation is being used there. Health communication is key for nurse practitioners as well. So I think um, that this is only the beginning, but I have learned so much from the experience I've had in doing this research and the colleagues that I've worked with on it that it's been very exciting. It sounds like it, and we are grateful for your work and your leadership and your involvement in Anaxel. And I encourage those on the call to, if you're not a member of Anaxel, to explore that because it is a great community um, of people who are working to further the science of simulation. Are there any other questions or comments as we move towards the close of this? Um, you have been a great audience as we've looked at these questions. Suzanne? Definitely, and I do see the question from Seema about um, translating the HCAT to Turkish, and uh, we can get in touch offline, Suzanne.Campbell at UBC.ca, Seema, if you could just email me, um, that would be really helpful. So if uh, someone could actually type that into the chat, the people could actually access you, Suzanne. If not, we can put oh, it sure. with a, yep. yeah. I could do that there as well. And, and I guess um, the other thing to, to let you know, uh, to look for in the future is as we're developing the global interprofessional tool, we hope by the end of this month, early February, to have the finalized version ready to go out. That's what we'll be testing with in British Columbia. But I will have a website we'll, where that will be available. And I do want to make one last plug in 2017. I hope by June, please look for the third edition of the them scenarios. It is very exciting to have the international lens, and I think you'll all be excited by the interprofessional um, scenarios. We had up to 17, I believe, this time, and the chapter on therapeutic communication where I do um, evaluate all of the communication tools that are out there. So that will be helpful as well. Well, that sounds like a nice contribution to the literature. So I'd just like to take a, a moment here and say thank you very much to Suzanne and Leanne um, for the, from the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, um, for engaging us around this award-winning research article. We, it has been very stimulating. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Suzanne uh, Cargan Egren and also Dr. Nicole Harder, who are our editors for clinical simulation in nursing, for their support in the dissemination of this important work. And also thanks to the NAXO Board of Directors for their commitment to advancing the science of healthcare simulation through the support of this online journal club, Roundtable. This inaugural roundtable has been informative and inspiring. I'm sure our participants have a lot to think about and to consider as they engage in their own work. So thank you, Suzanne and Leon, Leanne, for that, that inspiration. I wanted to tell everyone that you can actually access the archive of this Journal Club Roundtable or share it with others by going to anaxel.org and visiting the store. And you can spread the word to watch out for our next Journal Club Roundtable and join us again for stimulating discussion around a topic of interest. So thank you everyone, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for participating.